Yay, moms. Okay. You know, we may all be moms. Uh, and we, we, may not, we may not all be moms. <laughs> this is a great start, guys. But we all have moms, okay? Every one of us has a mom. And may we honor them today. You know, I hope that this little bottle campaign reaches out to those that need a mom's love at a very vulnerable time in their lives. And uh, we're, I'm excited to see what and participate with them. This Mother's Day, as this beautiful slide portrays, uh, let's, let's recognize all mothers. The ones who nurture their children, I know you probably can't read that, but that's what it says. The ones who nurture their children here on earth, the ones who carry some, if not all, their children in their hearts, and the ones who yearn just to conceive a child. Please, let's turn to 1 Peter 2, 2. You know, talking about babies and, and bottles, isn't it amazing how a newborn goes instantly for the milk? I mean, that is what they crave. Something is dreadfully wrong when a newborn doesn't crave milk. When we had our ranch back in Washington, we raised the bottle calves from, from bottles, calves to springers. You know, bo bottles, they're not the natural way that a calf drinks milk. You know, it's, it's not part of their instinct. You know, most of the time, we would have to train each calf to, to learn how to drink from a bottle. And the first few times that we'd present this bottle, dripping with milk, come get it, come get it, that calf would just run the other way. <laughs> no, I don't want, you're not my mama. I want something that's got, you know, you know I had black and white Holsteins. Something black and white with legs and, and covered with manure and, and something with a nipple on there so I can, you know, I want it to smell like mama. You know, I w it was a struggle to get that nipple in that baby's mouth. You'd have to tackle that calf, put, the, put its head between your legs, and, 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 and shove that thing. And, and the whole time this calf is trying to back up and is sitting down, falling down. You get, to, you get, his, you get his butt in the back of a corner. And I, I tell you what, a calf can back out of a corner. You can't. You know, and, and then, you, then you finally get it, and then you got to open his mouth, and, and he's in a wag and his head back and forth, and then you got his tongue to deal with. It's flopping back and forth, and slobber and drool, and milk spraying everywhere. You know, I, <laughs> my clothes always smelled like milk. Gee, you got the picture? If you haven't, you've probably done this, but if you haven't done this, you get the picture. This scene could go on for a while. But most of the time, everything changed as soon as that calf got this first swallow in. You know, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, his eyes got all bugged out. So, you know, man, it's sucking that thing down as fast as it can. And whoo, I got it, I got it, I finally get it. You were trying to feed me, not, not kill me. We Christians can do that with God's Word. You know, oh, we may read it and process and analyze and, uh, and analyze perspective of what it says, but there's, there's a natural fear that we all have to swallowing everything it says and to taste and see that the Lord is good. You know, the Holy Word must be digested and absorbed into the Christian life in order to grow up into salvation. In 1 Peter 2, starting with verse 2, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good, now that you've tasted, you caught that swallow down, He's good! Verse 4 says, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men. You know, 
men have a tendency to reject God. They, 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 they say, this isn't natural. You know, who's this? I mean, everything natural is, is a craving to fulfill our desires. God isn't natural to, to, to go to him and say, okay, I'm dying to myself. Rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay in Zion a chosen and precious cornerstone. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. You know, it isn't natural to crave pure spiritual milk. You know, there are many reasons that, and, and reasons many do not believe, and they reject. You know, some of us have to get pretty hungry, and there are all kinds of artificial stuff that the world, <laughs> the world, the flesh, and the devil offer as imitations to fulfilling your lives. And we get addicted to that stuff. And that becomes our natural inflow of what we think is what's going to help us grow and be the person that we want to be instead. And then again, knowing a lot of scripture and developing a statement of faith is not craving pure spiritual milk and growing up into salvation. You know, I, I get a kick out of the, the latest fads. Um, when I tell people, I, I tell people often, you know, <laughs> I drank my smoothie today. And, and a lot of times people will say, well, what brand is it? What, 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 what kind of powder you put in your smoothie? You know, I, I want to I be healthy too. And, and I tell them, no, 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 it's not like that. I just, I just go to the garden and grab a hundred, bunch of vegetables. I put a bunch of seeds in there and, and, uh, and eggs. <laughs> and, you know, good stuff, natural stuff, you know, vegetables, fruit, eggs, organic honey, and, uh, and uh, seeds. And I just put them in a blender and, and suck it on down. That's my smoothie. The powders the nutritionalists have developed claim to be healthy. And, and, and a lot of them have a certain health part. But for the most part, they're expensive imitations of the pure natural food right off the land. You know, when I tell, also when I tell people I'm a pastor... A lot of times they'll say, well, what brand are you? <laughs> you know, what denomination? What, what kind of church do you go to? What do you believe? You know, and I just tell them basically, I just take a bunch of scripture, you know, and, and I mix it all up and, and read it. And if I don't understand it, oh, well, it's going down anyways. And, and I just, that's the kind of, I, the holy word of God. I, this is infallible. And I take it and I say, this is it, guys. Whether you, whether you understand it or not, this is what you believe. This is what I believe. And I blend it together. You know, please understand, you know, I'm not saying that I've got it all together. And the other churches don't. We're a part of a universal body of Christ. And the fellowship we share among this area, church is wonderful. You know, I have a tendency to, to go for the imitation shake and bake stuff. Just as much as anybody else. And I, I trust you, each of you, to hold me accountable. To stay on track with true biblical teaching rather than spiritual fad diets. Okay, our natural sinful instincts and experiences in this world process into a worldly wisdom that fears God's provision of true, abundant, and enduring life. And we, we fear it. And, and everything about us, we, we need to be retrained. But once we understand it, once we take and swallow it, and, and actually do what, what God says, and we understand it worked. I mean, I, if, I, if I didn't work, you know, then I could say it didn't work. But when God says to give, and you give, and all of a sudden he provides, whoa, 
I tasted and seen. When God says to forgive, and, and, and I forgive somebody, and then all of a sudden I get a peace inside of me. It tastes great. Man, I want some more of this. You know, and other things, you know, when I, when I, when I pray for others, and it, it, just, it just keeps on growing into your spiritual walk. When we trust in Christ, everything is made new. You know, even the wounds we endure have a new purpose toward life and building one another up, not toward death and tearing down. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste Him. Get a swallow down. Get your eyes all bugged out. I want more. Uh, verse 7. Now to you who believe, the stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. And a stone that causes men to stumble. And a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. What they were destined for. You know, we, we read a lot about, you know, belief and rejection and all that stuff. And now all of a sudden we get to this word destined. While, while we're looking at this pure spiritual milk, there arises this issue of God's election. And then, then man's free will. Uh, in this short passage, and it appears that both sides are addressed. Man's belief or disobedience pitted against God's election, God's purpose, God's, God's ordination, destiny, prearranged. You know, the Bible does not have contradictions pitted against one another. There are contrasts in the unfathomable nature of God. You know, there's a strong temptation to twist one scripture, to re reconcile it, to make it fit with another scripture, another view, or a predisposed idea that we have in our hearts. You know, I've been in both camps, and both ways, and, 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 it, and it hit, I hit roadblocks. And, and, and I, I, I would like to just take this and explain everything. Okay, election, that's the way it is, man. It's, I can prove it. But then I hit a roadblock and I have to go to free will and say, well, I got a doctor free will up just to make it make, make the election part say, make sense. Or either I'm on the free will side and I, and I, and I look at election and I says, well, uh, this is really what... Uh, I'm at a loss. A lot of times on this particular one. And, and I'm using this, this issue today uh, as we taste and see that the Lord is good. I don't want to just gloss over the obvious today. These contrasts in faith are the pure spiritual milk. Everything in God's word is true and clear. Nothing should be processed or changed in scripture or in structure. Verse 8 we're going to continue. They stumble because they disobey. And if you, you see that, they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. And so we got a, a, an act of the will and then a destiny that God had prearranged. But you are a chosen people, another prearranged idea, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. You know, one thing that light does, it brings out colors. You know, in darkness, you know, we, we, we don't see contrast. Everything appears to agree. But as the light shines, the contrasts are what makes things beautiful. Light brings out the contrast. And, and when we have contrasts in Scripture, that isn't because Scripture isn't agreeing. It's just because we're not used to, we're so used to the dark that, that, that everything's a gray. And then all of a sudden the light hits us and, whoa, God. I don't understand you. Uh, everything I, uh, everything in, in my life before, I understood totally. Yeah, it was all black. <laughs> I can understand blackness. But when the light shines on things and, and all of a sudden everything starts going, wow. 
You know, you're bigger than I imagined. You're more than I thought I could ever. You know, it's a contrast. There's depth, contrast, width, and all kinds of other perceived and hidden dimensions revealed in this light that, that is beyond human wisdom. Crave, crave pure spiritual milk. Pure spiritual milk. Don't adulterate it. Don't mess it up. Drink it all. You know, in verse 10, I love how uh, this, this whole thing closes in verse 10. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Please, let's turn to Exodus 24. You know, I need to resist the, the natural urge to blot out the contrasts and smooth out dimensional peaks and valleys. So here we are, faced with a contrast. What do we do? Let's just try to swallow it in its pure state without processing out either camp. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. God called you to belong to him. You know, that's pretty clear in verse 9. We are chosen and called by God. And who resists his will? But right on the heels of this clear set in stone, preordained will of God from before the foundation of the earth comes this twist in verse 10. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And we'll look at that verse again two more times in two different passages. You know, I love it. You know, God won't let us settle on a fixed image of his sovereignty or other attributes. His being is hyperdimensional. It is beyond understanding, beyond time and space. His second of the Ten Commandments is proclaimed. And that's where we're at in Exodus 20, verse 4. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven, above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. You know, this command goes against carved wood. It go, go, goes against sculptured stone. It goes against molted metal. It, it, it goes against materialism, okay? If your God's materialism, if it's your car, or whatever you, you, you crave, and whatever you're spending most of your time and energy and thoughts on, it goes against that. It also goes against the imaginations of our mind. This is how I imagine God is, and I'm going to make my imagination fit and jive with Scripture if I have to doctor Scripture up to make my God my God because I want my God the way I want my God and I like him. Be careful. Be careful when we take scripture and we, we move it around to make it make sense. God makes sense. He doesn't give that alternative in the second commandment. No graven image. Did God preordain when and where he would change from restraining his mercy from a people to choose to show mercy instead on those same people? You know, has God planned to once again restrain that mercy that he gave to those people again and, and, and show his wrath? You know, to, what stimulus does God have for the purpose of his will for change? Please, let's turn to Romans 9, 11. You know, this, this last passage comes straight out of Hosea. And Paul uses this exact passage at the end of his most potent observation of the, the overarching capacity of God's purpose, will, and election. In Romans 9. Hosea is a twist in the heavenly drama as God restrains his wrath and pours out his mercy. It is the blending passage for both Peter and Paul's dialogue in the evaluation of God's justice balanced with his sovereignty and man's circumstances balanced with his choices. You know, the door of excuses of man is clearly shut by taking all of Scripture 
God is merciful, slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness. You know, I'm not making an argument for election or against it. I'm not making an argument for free will or against it. I'm holding up the true, infallible Word of God. I'm unashamedly testifying the unfathomable nature of God. You know, I crave this Word. I crave this Word. It is the pure spiritual milk that can grow up into salvation. You know, once I taste and see that it is good, I can't get enough of it. You know, I have to admit, though I've, I've been like that little baby calf, you know. I've, I've tossed back and forth. I've ran from it, you know, and I've wagged back and forth, you know, either you know, on this particular subject, uh, election and, 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 and free will. And, and I go, no, no, don't give it to me. And, and, and I've tried to use my tongue to argue and, 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 and to teach it. And, and I should just swallow it. Swallow every word, every word like it's the truth because it is the truth. I really wanted to present a, 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 a good speech on this topic. And, but the further I went into presenting my understanding and dissecting Scripture and changing Scripture to simplify it through my logic, the less pure it became. And I threw out an hour's worth of preaching. <laughs> Thank God, right? <laughs> I just, out the door, I just, done. The answer to biblical contrasts is simple. Believe all of it. Trust God through all of it. Romans 9, 11. Yet before the twins were born, or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger, just as, is, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau I hated. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not therefore depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. And, and, and we'll continue in this, but, but, but as I proceed and process this in a logical way, I, I tried wagging my head in both directions, from election to free will. I tried backing up to avoid this contrast from my natural instincts to understanding God in my pea brain head, okay? This is pea brain head. If this head can understand God, we've got a problem, okay? Houston, we've got a problem, <laughs> big problem. I tried to articulate with my tongue the foolishness, what I could never grasp and present to you all in a process understandable formula. You know, even if I made sense, it was fake news. Fake news. It would have blocked the process of tasting and swallowing this wonderful, pure spiritual milk. You know, I threw out, I threw that out to, to leave God's word intact and, and quit poking and shifting around it on my plate. You know, you, you, you ever been, been, you know, at the dinner table when there's a dog underneath the table? Okay? And, and, and you're just poking through and you got the broccoli and you got the steak and, 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 and whatever. And, and, you know, well, mom's not looking, you know, they go, you know, ah. I think that's what we do with God's Word. That's what the Pharisees did with God's Word. They wanted to believe what they wanted to believe. And when, when Jesus portrayed himself and, and Jesus says, you search the Scriptures, in them you think you have eternal life. But if you looked at them, they talk about me. They talk about Jesus. And they missed it because they were just playing with it. I like this one. I don't like that one. I like this one. I can fo focus on this one. And, and, the, and in the process, guess what happened? The dogs got it. The Jews rejected the chief cornerstone. And the dogs got it. And who's the dogs? 
the Gentiles. That's what the Gentiles said, the Phoenician woman said to Jesus when, when she says, oh, even the dogs eat from the crumbs of the table. Are we tasting it? Are we swallowing it? God cut off the natural olive branch to graft in a wild olive branch, the Gentiles. But will he not? Be careful. Cut off that natural, a wild olive branch to graft in the natural one again. That's all in Romans 2, but... You know, I don't need to know the calorie count or the protein, enzymes, and fats that are in milk. I don't need to know how my digestive system figures it all out and changes that milk to muscle and, and, and proteins and energy and, and, and works it out and, and forms organs. I just want to grow up in my salvation. The Lord is good. All there is about the Lord is good. You know, I, like I alluded to earlier, there are all kinds of imitation foods and, and drugs and, and protein mixes that claim to improve on nature. You know, I, I can throw out some example. Trans fat, okay? You know, why, why eat butter when you can have margarine? You know, why have natural oils that, that come from plants when we can adapt it and make trans fat out of it? Man, it didn't, might even be tastier. You can palate it. And, and, but what's it do to our system? You know, what, what, about, what about that other thing out there? Uh, uh, corn, high fructose corn syrup. Oh man, <laughs> that tastes good. You know, most, most of the pop, at least it was, is, is high fructose corn syrup. Yeah, we drink that stuff like it's out of style. It tastes good. You know, or, or, or you know, that syrup that we put on our pancakes, that's mostly high fructose corn syrup. It's, it's been adapted. It's been changed. It, it, we, we improved on nature. They, they're imitations of nature's true goodness and remedies. And, and we know now they end up destroying the body. You know, I wonder why billions of dollars are spent on substances that have the bad side effect list a mile long to present a, a few little ailments. You know, what have we become? But we do the same thing with this. The Pharisees did it, and I believe we do it. We get stuck on this. We get stuck on our own thoughts, and we, we forget to swallow it all and to take it all in and, and, and to especially let it change our lives instead of the lives around us. And when we have a, we have a good idea of, of you know, spoon-feeding it and trying to force it down everybody else's throat and make them change, you know, the way we like them. But to make it change us, to grow up in our salvation, that did... That, 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 you know, let's feed it to the dogs, man. There's a huge danger involved when pure spiritual milk of the word is messed with to make it simpler or more palatable. There are many popular imitations that claim to be true. Crave pure spiritual milk and thereby grow up in your salvation. Let's go to verse 17 out of Romans 9. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose that I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy whom he wants to have mercy, on whom he wants to have mercy and hardens whom he wants to harden. Swallow it, guys. Swallow this. Okay, try it. One of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? And, 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 and I, I want you to look at the questions, Mark. If you can, circle the question marks or highlight them. Then why does God still blame us? For who resists his will? But who are you, O oh man, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to him who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for noble purposes and some for common use? What if God, choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction? What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for glory? Even us! whom he also called, not from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. 
You know, like, you get that picture here, you know, of a kid at a table, okay? What if I don't like it? <laughs> what if it makes me sick? You know? <laughs> what if I can't chew it? <laughs> I remember <laughs> Tyson one time, he was, you know, we were eating round steak <laughs> or something. <laughs> and the whole dinner time, he's a... <laughs> you know, and, you know, we, we had to eat our food. But anyways, he had this, uh, this big piece of round steak in his mouth. And, and he knew he better eat it. But I guess it was just a little bit too big. And, and uh, you know, he got half of it is down his throat. And the other half was still in his <laughs> But <laughs> and anyways, uh, uh, what if? What if that happens? You know, and then there's that dog sitting under the table with getting all kinds of scraps. You know, I counted seven question marks in the last six verses. And Paul answers with Hosea. In verse 25, as he says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people. I will call her my loved one who is not my loved one. And it will happen that in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called sons of the living God. And if you can just backtrack all these thoughts, you know, we, we swallowed up. I chose Pharaoh for this very purpose. Esau, have I loved. I mean, Jacob, have I loved. Esau, I hate it. And, and, and they were not. And, and if you look at Hosea's kids, his three kids, Jezreel, Yahweh will destroy, Jehu's line and all of Israel, Lu Rama, no love, no pity. How would you like that for a name of a kid, you know? You will, you, Yahweh will no longer have compassion on Israel or forgive her sins. And then the last one, you know, Hosea, Gomer was obviously not having his child at that point. You know, he's different color and everything. But <laughs> this is just a picture. But it, his name means not mine, not my people. And Yahweh has rejected the Israelites for his people. And if we read um, this passage over here in, in Romans, he talks about Pharaoh and he talks about um, who are you to talk back to God and show what is formed. In, in, you know, and, and we think all along that, that it's all just, if we read this, it's just all fatalism. You know, why even try? It's all laid out in Scripture. But then God throws this in there. And he, and, he, and he throws a twist in there. And he says, yeah, I will show mercy on whom I show mercy. And I, but then he says, I will call them my people who are not my people. I will call her my loved one who is not my loved one. And it will happen in that very place where they, it was said to them, you are not my people. They will be called sons of the living God. Let's turn to Hosea 2.13. Is this confusing you? It does me. I got a lot of questions. Drink it anyway. Eat it anyway. You know, don't try to process either side or, or filter out anything. Keep it pure. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. You know, I, I notice something when I eat corn on the cob. Okay? Not all of it gets digested. Okay? I'm not telling you how I know, okay? But I just know that, that somehow not all the corn on the cob gets digested. You know, I, I could... I could Remedy this problem by taking corn and adapting it and changing the structure and making it high fructose corn syrup. And then all that previous evidence will probably be gone. Everything would appear, hey, everything's working normal. But is it? This pure spiritual milk is whole. And for the purpose of growing up in salvation. You know, I, I still eat corn on the cob. I crave corn on the cob. How many of you like corn on the cob? Okay. Does it matter if it all digests? No. It's probably even better that way. That way it's not wasted, you know. Well, you see, you, you, <laughs> you know, the, the other waste. Okay. There's a lot of good stuff in God's Word that I'm sure doesn't get completely digested. 
You know, I'm at the end of these passages and there are lumps of ideas that I have more questions than answers. You know, each one of us is unique in circumstance, perspective, experience, and understanding. Even those who are not loved by God and are not his people are called his loved ones and sons of the living God. You know, both Peter and Paul quoted Hosea in uniting the contrast of man's free will and God's election. This is relieving in that we don't have to twist anything. God provides the blender and brings it all together in his pure spiritual milk. God did, God's got it all taken care of. Election, free will, all that stuff. You know, it, it's okay, guys. We can, we can take it in. It's good. In Hosea 2, 13, I will punish her for the days she burned incense to the Baal. She decked herself with rings and jewelry and, and went after her lovers. But, she, but me she forgot, declares the Lord. Therefore, I am now going to allure her. I will lead her into a desert and speak tenderly to her. There I will give her back her vineyards and will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. There she will sing as in the days of her youth and in the days she came up out of Egypt. In that day, declares lo the Lord, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my master. I will plant her for myself. Okay, verse, verse 23. Skipping down to verse 23 from 16. I will plant her for myself in the land. I will show my love to the one I called, not my loved one. I will say to those called, not my people. You are my people. And they will say, you are my God. I'm, I'm so glad God didn't describe himself a, a, as a gray two-dimensional being. Okay? I'm so glad God didn't say, okay, this is God. This is my dimensions. This is who I am. There's just so much. I, I, I love Romans 11 to, to Romans 12 thing. You know, he's unfathomable beyond our imaginations. But then, this is how you know my will. Therefore, I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and perfect will of God. It's, it's not this. It's this. Jesus isn't here. He's inside of us. He's this is his hands and his feet. And when we start getting that and we're transformed by the renewal of our mind, that's when we start knowing his will. I love how even though we reject God, he still chooses us, calls us, and loves us. You know, maybe through discipline and dry times, it may, be, may seem that he's forcing his will on us, but it just takes one swallow, one, one, one taste to see that he's good. May we crave his pure spiritual milk that we may grow up together into a building of living stones with Jesus as a chief cornerstone. Let's pray. Lord God, we just thank you for this day. And Lord, help us to, to, to know your will. Not, not head knowledge, but living knowledge, tasting and seeing that you're good. Lord, may this be, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.